Carl Barclay, it's been a while since we've talked. And um, Gabrielle, it's nice to know you and Carl are working together on a very important project. Carl, all through the tour that we did before the election, you were appearing at meetings and talking about the people getting back Marsden Point and how important it is. So, Carl, can we begin by reiterating why it should matter to all New Zealanders that we get Marsden Point back for New Zealand? Well, Marsden Point was built in 1962 to give us fuel security, and it's the only refinery we had, and it gave us 68% of our um, petrol and diesel and um, 89% of our jet fuel and 120,000 tonne of bitumen, CO2 and sulphur. So, no, it's crazy to have it closed down. We're, we're too far away from anywhere to be reliant on what we've got now, which is um, totally uh, sh sh shipping our finished product in here. And that, for people who don't realise how vulnerable we are, if a ship is turned away or can't get to New Zealand or the shipping lanes are stopped because of some world crisis, as we've seen in America with the bridge blowing up, it's stopping uh, the, the transport of important goods in America. We are left potentially very quickly without fuel in this country, are we not, Carl? Well, I've been told by people in the industry it's eight days. The government tried to tell us it's 24 days. Um, we used to have a, an agreement, a world agreement, that everybody had 90 days supply. Um, four days. The ship, ships are taking 18 to 22 days to get here. It, we're not going to run out very uh, – won't take long to run out if those tankers don't turn up. So every Kiwi who sees this opening needs to watch this interview and take steps to help Carl, because imagine if after four days of some fuel crisis here, there's no more possibility of you running your cars. And that is something that has not yet got into mainstream media. Gabrielle, tell me how you have become involved with Carl on this important project. Uh, just uh, with Carl, as we we are part of Operation Good Oil first and foremost, but um, Carl has been part or the major part of the on ground action and campaigning uh, for buyback Marsden um, campaign. So, at the moment, we're rallying behind him again. Uh, we've set up a new a new initiative called Cafe. So it stands for Collective Action for Energy Stability. And this initiative involves the shareholders in general. So at the moment, we've got about 130 plus shareholders on board uh, that we are able to email uh, consistently um, during the week. Sorry, Liz, I'm losing my words. But consistently during the week, and we keep them up to date with the progress that is happening um, behind the scenes. So we have a real good team with us, and we're all rallying behind each other to make sure uh, that Marsden Point Oil Refinery is reinstated. So you're talking about getting the numbers behind Carl to really make it possible to make change. If people are shareholders of Marsden Point, should they be part of your organisation, your group then? Gabriel. Yes, definitely. Well, we're we're an unincorporated society. We're definitely for the people. We're working for the people. Both myself and Carl work for free. Uh, this is a matter of our national security. That's what I think, um, our national fuel security. So this is something that our entire country needs to get on board. All of the, our general public need to realise uh, what is happening behind the scenes in regard to our, our, our fuel security. And I just want to mention, Liz, it's, it's recently became a geopolitical issue. Uh, what is happening overseas with the Russian refineries uh, is now going to affect us um, as a whole. So uh, them becoming an import terminal, channel infrastructure, and what is happening in Russia in regard to the oil refineries is now, I think, in my personal opinion, about to affect us majorly. Tell us what's happening, Gabriel, and then you, Carl. Give us an update on Russia. Yeah, so Liz, this was a report made um, online. It was a statement put out. Uh, it just says, New York, April 3rd, oil prices settled at their highest levels since late October on Wednesday as investors worried about supply disruptions from a worsening geopolitical landscape, although a jump in US crude oil inventories eased some of those concerns. So this has uh, definitely got to do what's with what's happening in Russia. Um, obviously, I think we we mainly re rely on the Asian refineries now, so I think Carl can sort of update you on that part. Carl, can you tell us a bit more? Where are we sourcing our, our product from? And I know you have told me 
previously it's very much less quality than the than the new zealand um products that we used to have when marsden point was operational if there's an issue with getting crude oil from uh, russia i think the um, asian refineries might struggle to um keep up their production levels because a lot of the crude oil is coming out of russia goodness me and and, and from the um Arab, arabs with the um Suez canal and, and the uh, or around that area, if there's conflicts, um, they're not going to have the crude oil. We're not going to have the finished product here. Um, we don't have we don't have a storage of crude oil in a refinery to carry us on. We can't we can't turn 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 on to using more of New Zealand's crude oil because we don't have a refinery to turn on. So they'll put us in a really tricky position. The the, the government and the management that are running channel infrastructure now. That's why I need to be on the board and Daniel needs to be on the board so we can actually turn this thing around. We need to stop them from pouring the place and turn it around. Just just to sheet that that important point home. So oil will come to somewhere in Asia where it might be refined, where it used to be refined very efficiently here in New Zealand at Marston Point. Now the refinery in Asia is substandard, is it not, Carl? The product we get is substandard. Um, I'm getting that from a lot of people. Yes, there's lots of reports of there's a uh, car dealer in Wellington who's got 50-odd cars he fills up. He's had one that cost him eight hundred dollars to repair. It had um, issues with the fuel. A lot of dirt that used to be refined away at Marsden Point can be in the product. That's another whole interview, and we have covered that off earlier. But let's move to the substance of today. So, as you say, you want to get on that board with Daniel Rurik. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Okay. So, what's that going to involve, and how can people get involved, Carl? Um, everybody that's a shareholder to, to um, vote for us, either for a proxy vote or, or online, when they get the chance, or come to Wellington to the uh, Cape Town and, and, and join us at the um, a, the AGM, or it's a, what they call it, annual shareholders meeting, ASM. When is that? What date is that? 30th of April. I think it's a Tuesday. Tuesday the 30th of April at 2 o'clock? I think that's the time, yeah. Okay, and what sort of resistance are you getting, both of you, standing for the the Marsden Point board? Well, I can't believe it. They've actually printed a document out already that's on the uh, NZX, if you look into it, and um, I can send you the link to it so you can go right to it. And it, it, it talks about um, uh, our nominations and, and experience we've got. Then it turns around and says, oh, these two gentlemen haven't had enough time to be vetted. By, by the board, well, we we only just found out that they were looking for board members um, just recently. Um, I'm an engineer by trade. Daniel's um, also got engineering qualifications. Um, I'm, I'm um, farming background as well. Um, I've had a, a couple of small businesses. I've employed people. I know about health and safety. I've got boiler tickets. I'm a, I'm an engineer welder by trade, machinist. So I've got mechanical skills. And they turn around and say, oh, these, these people are not suited for the board. Now, there's one thing they said. These people are only focused on one thing, one issue. Of course, we're only focused on one issue. Our issue is to get the refinery going. They've got other harebrained schemes of um, solar farms and other other things, making um, bio aviation fuel and stuff like that. The market doesn't want it. And they're talking about making 3% of this biofuel. We made 89% of the, um, the, the, the jet fuel in New Zealand, which was high-quality jet fuel. It was such high quality that the Americans used to stop here, didn't they, on their way back from Antarctica to stock up because our jet fuel was of such world-class quality from Marston Point. Australian Airlines were coming from Europe. And they'd fly all the way to New Zealand to unload 10 people so they had an excuse to land at Auckland Airport to fill up with fuel to go back to, to Europe uh, before they flew those passengers to Australia. So they got Who, a, a, who a, are the on. other people on the board, Carl? Who are the people that you're up against? Are these absolute acolytes of Labour and now National? Do we know who, who the other people are? Are they sellouts to the World Economic Forum agenda? to run down fuel in countries around the world and and stop the ability of people to be free in their cars. Who are they? Have you researched them? No, I haven't had um, bothered doing that. So I've got other things to do. But um, if, you, if you look at who's on the board now and who was on the board prior to them starting to wind this thing up, there's, there's Andrew Brewer that's been there in the background for a while. 
he was running it before Naomi James came and finally uh, closed the place down and decommissioned it. He's now back on the board. He's also tied up with uh, Z Energy, which is, is now owned by Ampel Australia. The condition of the refinery closed down was that um, the government sold Z Energy to Ampel Australia and the conditions of purchase was you close our refinery down. So it just there's too, too many conflicts of interest. Um, if these people aren't tied up with the WHO or the um, WEF, I'd be very surprised. They're all young academics. So that's really important we get someone real on this board, Gabriel, isn't it? How can New Zealanders get behind it? it is it a matter of many of us taking out shares and getting along to that meeting on the 30th of April and demanding that Carl and Daniel be on the board? What do you suggest, Gabriel? Uh, at the moment, Liz, I think it is important for us to get the word out there that there is Kyle and Daniel standing in for us. Um, in regard to the, our national fuel security, this is what we need at this very moment. We actually needed this two years ago for that refinery to be operational. And if we can't get it operational again, then it needs there needs to be a new refinery, an updated refinery put in place. And um, as we know, uh, Winston Peters and Shane Jones have been very vocal about the issue, but all they've uh, come out with to date is that they will be putting in place an inquiry in the latter part of the year. By then, it's too late. If people do not already know, uh, the hydrocracker, which is one of the most important pieces of infrastructure in regard to Marsden Point Oil Refinery, will be or is planned to be sold off to Cedra Energy by July 7th, 2024. So this is what we are here uh, to hopefully stop, Liz, and we've got plans in place to hopefully make that happen. Tell us why the hydrocracker matters so much, Carl. It's the start of the process. It's where the oil goes into and starts the boiling process, and as it goes higher up the column, it, it starts off at diesel, becomes jet fuel, and then carries on to become petrol and NAFTA at the top. And, and what's left at the bottom is a residue, which this is one thing they closed down two years before they shut the refinery down, was the bitumen plant, and that extracts the um, oil out of, out of the, um, the residue at the bottom, which gives us bitumen. And our bitumen at the moment that's imported is washing away in the heavy rains. It's, it's seriously substandard as well. So New Zealand seems to be losing every which way out of what's been done since Jacinda Ardern closed down this refinery, Gabrielle. What can people do to really get behind it in big numbers now? Definitely. We need to push the word out, Liz, for everyone to become shareholders because that's where it starts. In order to have a say in what happens with channel infrastructure and the refinery itself moving forward, we need to become shareholders so that we have the power to vote. This is this is what is happening right now. Our channel infrastructure is a public company, but again, I believe the government have sort of deserted us as a people and left it in the hands of major oil companies. So what um, Kyle was saying before about Andrew Brewer. Um, he is part of the directorship for Ampo Australia. So we are seeing people on the board of directors that have a uh, vested interest. I think that's what it's called. But they are working for these big oil companies behind the scenes. We do not have those motivations. We only have motivations for the people and for the right thing to do for our nation, for our country. This is where we stand. So I know Kyle Barkley and Daniel uh, Rurik are the two best options for uh, nominees or elected nominees for the Board of Directors for Channel Infrastructure New Zealand. I can vouch for Carl, who I know well from his loyalty coming through the country before the election. He He's given up. I'm sorry to talk about you in the third person, Carl, but Gabriel, he's given up everything. He's been living at times in cold cars and in, 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 you know, in park grounds where he'll park up at night so he can do a meeting in that town the next day, trying to make Kiwis wake up and care. That is a man putting everything he has on the line for this country, isn't it, Gabriel? Yes, and it's very hard to watch sometimes, Liz. I mean, here's a man that is dedicating his life uh, to make sure we get what we need as New Zealanders. So again, working for free, working from the goodness of his heart, but a I think he knows why we're doing this, um, not just for our people, but for our children. So first and foremost, we need to make sure that our children and their future is secure because at the moment um, we have no oil refinery and we can't rely on EVs or anything else that they've said uh, will be viable because it's just not. It's just a pipe dream in my eyes. 
Carl, I would put a call out to our farmers who won't be able to run their farms if they can't get access to good fuel. Please, it is way past time that you do what's happening in Europe, in Poland, in Romania, in Italy, in France, in London. Andrew Bridgen was telling me they all rocked up in front of Big Ben on their tractors. We've had enough. For the last 20 years, we've been attacked by the political classes telling us how to farm in the countryside. We don't need townies to tell us how to farm. The farmers need to come to this meeting in Wellington on their tractors on the 30th of April and get off and support you, don't they, Carl? Where's Groundswell? I, I talk to Laurie and Bryce quite regularly. I've met them personally, and they're not doing anything. They're absolutely has, not doing anything. It has to go beyond Groundswell. It seems as if Groundswell has corralled them into a pen and just left them like sheep. You've got to break out of the pen, New Zealand farmers. You've got to be inspired by your European counterparts. And this is the chance to get going. Just turn up in Wellington and support Carl. But Carl, what about buying of shares? What do people do if they want to sign up and get enough shares to vote for you and Daniel at this upcoming meeting at the end of the month? Well, they've got to, <clears throat> got to have their shares um, bought um before the 30th, so um, about a week or eight days before the um, meeting, they really need to be shareholders. Um, if they can't afford many shares, just do them through shares. We've got the link there. That's a cheap option. Or if you've got, if you want to buy 100 shares, I suggest you go and buy them for a share broker. I bought um, 1,000 shares through um, the ASB. It's, it's still not a simple um, way of doing it, but um, and it costs $15 um, for the parcel of shares, but it's cheaper than some of the other share brokers. Uh, that way you become a shareholder, registered shareholder, and your name gets on the register, which we've got hold of. And the one through shares is you get a vote, but it's not the same because you're part of their parcel. But um, no, I just there's, every Kiwi in this country should have 100 shares, and every business in this country that uses fuel in any way, most businesses are affected by fuel, transport or whatever, need to buy at least $1,000 worth of shares and, and, and sit, sit on them and um, support us. There's, there's another option too. When it comes to voting, as well as voting for Daniel and myself and our resolution to stop the destruction and have a – we're um, putting forward that they engage a, um, a suitably qualified engineering firm to go over the whole place, tell us what sort of damage has been done, tell us what the estimate to um, – cost to repair that and time frame to repair that and get it operational again or or we have to build a new one. I, I hope we don't have to build a new one because it's about $6 billion to build a new refinery of similar size. But the other option is at the voting, there's three of the present board that are up for re-election. Don't vote for them. Give them the no vote. So that gets rid of three of them and puts two of us in and then hopefully they have to find another three. That's mean we'll have five people on the board if we can get another three um People, I've been talking to people in the um, uh, aviation industry. I was down at uh, Warbirds for three days. I slept in my front seat of my van for those three days. Uh, I went up to the McKenzie Country Show. I slept in my van, front seat of the van that, that night for that show. Um, I'm, I'm talking to the people out there that, that are concerned. They don't know how to sort this out. They keep saying, oh, the government's going to do it. The government's not going to do it. Winston's going to have an inquiry. His inquiry would be like the inquiry they had for Pike River Mine. What happened there? The 29 men never came out of that mine, and the thing got sealed up after wasting $60 million. I'm not happy with inquiries. We need action. The only action is through the shareholders. So come and join us. $10 will buy you some shares through sharesies, or if you want to spend $100,000, do it for a share broker. What did you say? If you want to spend $100,000? 
Oh, if somebody wants to spend a hundred or a thousand dollars, oh, do it for a few that one <laughs> I, I wasn't going to advertise a hundred thousand dollars. I think there are a lot of well, Kiwis. <laughs> listen, by the sheer the sheer register is interesting reading. There's some people out there have got hundreds of thousands of shares in this place. Yeah, for all the wealthy ones, and there are a lot of farmers who still have family wealth. It's going to benefit you to buy a hundred or a thousand dollars worth of shares, or if you can, a hundred thousand dollars worth of shares, whatever you can afford. What you're saying, Carl, is spend what you can to get the shares you can to be able to have a say. Is that correct? Well, before Christmas, I had the um, the figures came out that we the public listing, the, the general public shareholding was at forty six percent. And now we're over 50, 51.5. We were up to 52.7, but it's dropped back slightly. But we're still over that 51%, which means we're the controlling shareholders. So I, I wanted to lift that figure up to 60, maybe 70, 75%. So we've really got the control and we can push some of the oil industry people out of, out of the industry. They don't. They shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be controlling it. Before, when they were um, running it as an oil refinery, they were getting the refi refining done cheaper than they should have been. And they, they were supplying the oil to the oil refinery. The oil refinery should have been the purchase of the of the crude product and be selling the finished product to them. They, they were screwing us in all different directions. It's absolutely appalling, the corruption in New Zealand. And if people want to really judge Jacinda Ardern's record, there was no good reason for her to shut down our Marsden oil refinery, was there, Carl? Well, they had a, an issue that, that they'd got rid of the bitumen plants. So that took a lot of their revenue away. They could have doubled the price of their bitumen. They could have even tripled the price of their bitumen and still been the same price as what this rubbish is. Um, they've destroyed all our roads. It's going to cost billions to fix these roads. Are they going to keep importing the same crap or are we going to build, get this refinery going? And then we had COVID come along and there was no air travel. So the 89% of the jet fuel, which was a big earner for them as well, and diesel because nothing was happening, disappeared. It, it only disappeared for a short period of time before New Zealand got cranking again. But in that time frame, they could have opted to go into their maintenance mode. They could have done what they did when they closed the place down and washed it up and got in and done some um, maintenance that, that um, would have had them set ready to go again. It's just crazy. They, they chose to close this thing down. They, they engineered to close this thing down. It didn't close down because it was uneconomical because at the end of the day, you pay what you pay in the fuel tank at the, at the service station. And if we haven't got an oil refinery here that, that's on our shores that can recycle stuff, um, that can uh, re-blend it if the 30% that was coming in from the other suppliers is out of spec, Marsden Point was able to re do that. And, and Craig's talked about that before in some of the interviews you've had. I, I'm talking to um, Plastback and the people of the plastic industry in New Zealand we could re recycle all the plastic waste in New Zealand back into diesel and re-refine it at Marston Point and run our fleet on, on our rubbish. None of, the, none of the plastic should have to go to rubbish dump. It could go back to, for a process and end up back at Marston Point. You make so many good points, and we will add the previous interviews underneath this this piece as well that we've done. But, Gabriel, it's a heartbreak, isn't it, when you have young children or grandchildren to think of the sabotage of our country. This was a form of sabotaging New Zealand by Jacinda Ardern's government, to my way of thinking. Do you agree with that, Gabriel? 100%, Liz. And from what we've just recently found out, it will be coming out in a report very shortly. So Operation Good Oil, um, headed by Levi Wolf, will have our second report out by the end of the month, just in time for the um, ASM, the annual shareholders meeting on the 30th. So there are things happening in the background, Liz, and I will keep you up to date as we progress, but a lot of it is communication now and, and definitely communicating with the company secretary of CHI, Chris Bogan. Uh, me and him have a very good email relationship. So uh, we will be getting a lot of answers we need for our people before the meeting itself goes ahead. And we are also looking at uh, getting the contract that was signed with CHI and Cedra Energy. We have a legal team in the background that is working on a scoping exercise and a possible injunction to stop uh, the further dismantling or destruction of Marsden Point oil refinery, but also to stop the, the sale of decommissioned assets um, that belong to the public of New Zealand, might I add, paid with taxpayer dollars. <laughs>
So could I say to all the very wealthy New Zealanders out there who love their Maseratis and your Lamborghinis and whatever other playthings you have, this is where you step up. You can really contribute to your country because I think even the wealthiest are realizing their their lifestyle is now in danger in New Zealand. If these people in government, these glove puppets of the globalists, are allowed to continue their destruction of New Zealand, if you can give money uh, to to this operation to save Marsden Point, then you really could take out injunctions that could at least buy time, Gabriel. Would that be would that be a fair call? Have you have you got a fund up and running for that for legal fees? Yes, Liz, we, we definitely have a committee um, up and running for cafes. So we, we've got our uh, non-incorporated, sorry, our unincorporated not-for-profit bank accounts set up, which we do uh, get funds into. At the moment, we do have enough um, funds for the scoping exercise to be covered halfway through, but we still need help getting that uh, fully done so that we can pay our legal team. So we were quoted around $5,600 just for the scoping exercise itself to be done. Um, our legal team have come back to us and said if they can find clauses in that contract that was signed with CHI and Cedric Energy, we may not even have to go through with the entire injunction. So this is what we're looking at, making it easier for our people, but also um, making sure that the people that are doing the work for us, because they are lawyers, um, get paid what they are owed because, in, in essence, they're stepping in and helping us stop further destruction um, of the refinery itself. So that's something to watch, whether you will in future need to take out injunction uh, legal action. But just keep us updated on that. What do you feel about the possibility of taking an injunction to stop this happening, Carl? Um, that was the avenue we were looking for to start with. We were hoping that Winston Peters or somebody like that would have, would have engaged in that in their um, first 100 days, but they haven't bothered. Uh, we were quoted something like $100,000 maybe. Uh, it could be more. Uh, it's a lot of money, and it's a, it's a time frame that won't stop this. What we're proposing right now is through the board, uh, my, um, my, my resolution is to stop them from destroying it as of the 30th of April when we have this meeting. And if we get on the board, I'll be pushing that even harder. And, and if I'm on the board, there's information they can't withhold from me. So um, the best thing they can do is get me on the board. Anybody that wants to become a shareholder, they're, they're only about $1.52 a share. You're not putting a lot of money into it. Um, but the, the thing is that Ampel, the people that help close our refinery down, their shares are worth $43 each. So... They're capitalising out of our oil and gas, and now they're, they've got a huge profit. Uh, that, that's disgusting. And what your point was earlier about the inquiry later in the year, run by, you know, pushed by Winston Peters for later in the year, I absolutely back you up, Carl. When I was in mainstream media, so many of these inquiries just become irrelevant reports on dusty shelves in some long lost beehive office. You know, they they have no power at all. Can you get hold of Winston Peters directly and say, show us the color of your money, show us that you're sincere, come to the meeting and, and be part of what the people want on April the 30th? Can you get hold of him, Carl? Yeah. Um, in the weekend, while I was at the uh, McKenzie show on, on Monday, um, I'd, I'd been past the um, New Zealand First stand and then um, just happened to see this guy walking past, and I said, "Oh, you, Mark Patterson." And he turned around and came back. And I said, "What are you doing about Mars and Point?" Oh, we're having an inquiry. We're doing all this. We're doing all that. I said, "No, you're not. You need to be stopping stopping this thing." And he started abusing me. He, he, F word came out of his mouth several times. I said, "Excuse me, you're you're an MP. You shouldn't be swearing at me like that." And then he apologised, and then he carried on. And he saw our logo on the front of my van about NZ Law, and he said, "Oh, well, they've done nothing. They're not in government." And um, I, and I. I, I I questioned about a few other things that uh, New Zealand First had done over the years with like, Hillside Workshops. Oh, at least we've built a new one now. It's But it, they've wasted $100 million. It was only $12.5 million originally in 2009. So it, it, just they're, they're in power, but they th seem to think they're, um, they're not our servants. So they're not working for us. 
And this was the point when Winston came through the Freedom Village. She said, it's terrible, these politicians are not listening to the people. Winston, again, so many appeals to you. Listen to Carl. Contact him. Be with the people on Marston Point. He's got so many chances in his in his frankly, dotage, because he's in his old age now. He's past, you know, um, he's in his 80s, so he could really leave a legacy of heroism on Barry Young and on Marsden Point. And instead, you're not able to get through, Carl. That breaks my heart. Well, I said to Mark Patterson, I've sent your emails. Have you not got them? He said, oh, I get thousands, thousands. We don't have time to read them all. I said, this one's about Marsden Point, mate. It's, it's the most critical thing in New Zealand at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. Without fuel, we don't have a rural New Zealand. Now, Carl, are there any other meetings around the country before the 30th of April where people can come and support you? And secondly, where they can talk directly to you and find out more? I'm trying to organise a, a meeting for Sunday or Monday in Christchurch, maybe two two meetings in Christchurch. And then on the 10th, I'll be in Greymouth at the Union Hotel, 7 o'clock for a meeting in, on for the West Coast. And I'll be at Ag Fest on Friday and Saturday, and then I'm heading up to Tarkica, Motraker, Nelson, and then Blenheim before I head across the ditch before the 23rd. Gabriel, if you could send us something on those meetings, we can put that up um, underneath this interview for people to really have an idea of where they can go and talk one-to-one with Carl. You're so approachable, Carl. Are you able to... uh, survive yourself financially? Do you need help financially from the country? And do you need places to stay, my friend, as you travel around New Zealand so bravely? Oh, I certainly appreciate somewhere to stay and a nice hot shower and some friendly faces to talk to. Um, I'm, I'm getting quite a bit of that, but unfortunately in Wanaka that didn't happen, but that's part of the part of the thing. Um, as far as funds go, I, I probably need a help to get across the Cook Strait Ferry and my Petrol bills started to build back up again because I'm back on the road again. So I possibly can spend a thousand dollars a month on fuel traveling New Zealand. So, how can people get some financial help in an account? Can we put an account up here for you? I've got an account that people can put in for donations into my bank account. Great. We'll put that at the end of this. So we should all meet in Wellington on the 30th for this big meeting. Final thoughts from you, Gabriel, for New Zealanders to really think about the importance of what's coming up for this country. Yeah, this, I, I think we only get one shot, Liz, and this is our shot. Like This is something that we never actually thought would happen. One, people didn't think that the share, the general shareholders' um, percentage would actually go over 50%. Cole proved them wrong. He kept going for the past nearly two years uh, to make this happen. It's now happened. Um, we have now um, been able to get both him and Daniel to be elected for the running uh, as nominees for the Board of Channel Infrastructure. Again, another move that couldn't have happened. And I will uh, quote God in this because I think he has a big deal to do with what is happening right now and giving us the chance to make things right. But we still have to work for it. So we still have to work hard behind the scenes and do what we have to do in order to make uh, things happen for our nation. So I just want to let people know also out there that are wanting to buy shares. If you need assistance in that, please email me at admin at cafes.org.nz and I can assist you uh, through that process but also bring you on board so we can keep you up to date uh, up, right up until the 30th of April and that includes Cole's um, events that he will be having leading up. So we've got some big things planned and a lot of work to do and we would appreciate your help in the background. Mm-hmm. It's a very good plea and I like the way you said we've managed to get them elected. What you're doing there, Gabriel, is visualising the good has already happened. No, it's great. Um, we've got them nominated and we absolutely have to get them elected to represent the interests of the people. Carl, I want final words from you to the people of New Zealand. Uh, this this um, refinery was built in 1962 with um, taxpayers' money by Sir Keith Oliok's national government. And uh, it was built for our fuel securities. And every time it's had an upgrade, it's been paid for by the taxpayers of New Zealand. Uh, somehow the politicians managed to get it into the hands of the uh, oil companies. And w- when when we say it's just Jacinda's government that caused this problem, no, it's not. National Act and uh, Winston's New Zealand First Party should have been two years ago making sure this thing was mothballed so at least we could have started it back up again. The damage they've done now is it's not mothballed. It needs work done on it to bring it back. And it, it could take 
12 months, it could take two years. If we build a new one, it could take five years. We haven't got five years. We haven't got two years. We need to get this thing sorted now, stop them from destroying it anymore, and, and work out what we can do to it. Maybe we can rebuild it, but not to the standard we want, and then in five years' time, we do build a new refinery. Who knows what the population of the world is going to be like in five years' time? Uh, that's another issue I'm concerned about, you know, sort of. But saying that, um, Australia is short of fuel. We could be selling our surplus fuel to Australia. This refinery could still be economical, e even if it's not supplying um, all its all its production to New Zealand. We could be exporting it, especially if we're making high quality bitumen as well. And that hydro cracker you mentioned, we cannot have that taken offshore. We need that to remain here. And a lot of number eight wire and Kiwi ingenuity and cleverness coming together around this important issue. Kiwis would find a way back if we could just get the corrupted ones out of government. Thank you so much, Gabrielle and Carl, for what you're doing. And may New Zealanders on this issue all come together from whatever political colour and say, we're going to get behind Carl and get. Carl and Daniel, on that board at Marsden Point. Thank you both. There's one critical thing at Marsden Point. The people that run the refinery were tradesmen. They weren't office wallers. They were tradesmen that made that refinery. The office staff supported them, but it was the, the trades expertise that kept that place running. Same as what we've got down at um, uh, Invercargill at TY Point. They make the best aluminium in the world. For 50 years they've been doing that. It's that Kiwi ingenuity, isn't it, Carl? That cleverness, that creativity. Yeah. That's what we need to celebrate here. Thank you both. Talk soon. Thanks, Bye-bye.